Hello! There is more than meets the eye in this little bit of polygonal masonry that, being an imposing as it is, will tell us a big tale. See, not all polygonal masonry is famous and massive, such as the mind-boggling ancient constructions with interlocking stones that mysteriously appear and then disappear all around the world, in places like Peru, Greece, Japan, etc. etc. Cyclopean walls can be quite shy, small and found in places hardly anyone ever visits. Nevertheless, they all raise some undying questions. Such is the case of the Lusitanian polygonal walls, in Portugal, that are basically unknown, even by me, despite having all the reasons in the world to have known about them, including this YouTube channel. The truth is that, until this year, I had never heard of the Lusitanian Cyclopean walls before. So, let's try and set that record straight. Despite feeling a bit like the work of the Lilliputians, with small stones and a short length, this bit of wall from a place called Castro Sabroso in northern Portugal can be justly considered polygonal. And to deserve this prestigious title, the wall had to meet the following criteria. 1. It's built with dry stone technique, i.e. without the use of mortar, nor any other glue securing the stones together that, whilst resisting for thousands of years, by the effect of gravity and the interlocking stone alone. 2. With fitted stones, dry stone technique, at least in its most basic form, does not require shaping the stones to fit one onto another, but for a wall to be proper polygonal, the stones must be cut to match. In Castro Sabroso, the fitting is quite competent, with hardly any space in between the rocks although the small stone size did make it easier to build. And, although it's optional, number 3. It is used for earthworks, creating an acropolis, an elevated plain, just like in Athens. That is the case in Sabroso, where the wall secured a flat surface on top of the hill. That little stretch of wall in Castro Sabroso is not a one-off case. Similar walls can be found all around this area, extending from the northern coast of Portugal deep into what is now Spain, up close to Madrid, a region that was called Lusitania by the Romans. Today, less than a handful of such polygonal walls still survive, including the cool ones near Salamanca in the Spanish side of Lusitania, that are larger and better preserved. But there would have been several dozens of these walls, basically one in each of the ancient villages called Castros or Citanias. Castro just means castle in Latin, so it's not a very revealing as a name in itself. Either way, that word ended up defining the Iron Age culture of Lusitania that produced these cyclopean walls, the Castro culture. The Lusitania polygonal walls and the Castro culture are dated to the 1st millennium BC, lasting from the Late Bronze Age or beginning of the Iron Age up until the arrival of the Romans. The end side of this timeline is easy to pinpoint. The Romans not only introduced writing, they were like teenage girls with a vlog, recording every little detail in their lives. So, we know a bit too much about the way the Romans saw the people they were conquering but cannot really understand how the others saw themselves. This results with the Castro culture being attributed to a couple of different ethnic groups. For one, there are the Galician Gauls, who are a totally Celtic people, with bagpipes, skirts and all. 
Although there is the possibility that all that paraphernalia arrived way later with the Britons leaving England during the fall of Rome. And then there are the Lusitanian propers. They are not quite Celtic and are the true polygonal wall builders. And to make sure we know that much, they also built all the other weird stuff in stone we'll see going forward. On top of that, on the Spanish side of the present border, the Lusitanians are called Vetones, despite being the exact same people. This other name exists because either the ancient peoples had extreme sensibility to 20th century politics, or else it means we are often force-fed propaganda as if it was history. Castros are much more than the primitive hill fort the name suggests. Those Lusitanians had great stuff on top of polygonal walls that are the crown jewel of any prehistoric builder. Let's see. They had pig statues. The Lusitanians loved their pork and celebrated the delicious charcuterie with colossal pig statues to be found centerpiece in many of the Castros. There are the Pedra Formosas, which translates as the beautiful stones. These richly decorated handsome stones would mark the entrance for a hot sauna, or so they say. I just cannot unsee how similar these pretty stones are to the tombs of giants in Sardinia. Oh, but wait, there's more. There's this. God knows what this is. Some carved weird shape into big boulders, of which the most notable examples are found in Panoyas, in the Portuguese side, and in Ulaca, on the Spanish one. Academics will say it's nothing more than another coincidence, but the fact is that these crazy shapes are oddly similar to others in Italy, Peru or Japan, and are always to be found one stone throw away from polygonal walls. But let's move on. With all these stone constructions, the polygonal walls, the pigs, the saunas and the abstract sculptures, it's safe to say the Castro culture was its own thing, old, established and seasoned with multiple influences. But no, academics affirm Lusitanians are just another bunch of NPC cults. Are the Lusitanian Celts? Well, that's complicated. So, let me try and get AI to help with that. The year is 50 BC, Gaul is entirely occupied by the Romans. Well, not entirely, one small village, of indomitable Gauls, still holds out against the invaders. And life is not easy for the Roman legionaries. No, I love Obelix, but he's totally wrong about the Meniers. It is as much fiction as academia. The year is 70 BC, Iberia is entirely occupied by the Romans. Well, not entirely, one small village, of indomitable Lusitanians, still holds out against the invaders. And life is not easy for the Roman legionaries. That's more like it. One Roman general even said, and I quote, There is, in the westernmost part of Iberia, a very odd people, that they don't rule themselves, nor they allow others to rule them. But we are looking for events that happened before that. The year is 30,000 BC. Europe is entirely occupied by Cro-Magnon. Well, not entirely. One small village of indomitable Neanderthal still holds out, and in Lepedo, one mixed boy was just born. Hey, not so long ago. True, the Lepedo boy proves that, at least in Lusitania, the cro were mixing with the Neanderthals, which is a big deal. But we are looking for something relatively young. The year is 1991. Europe is no longer entirely occupied by the Soviets and McDonald's reaches everywhere. Well, not entirely. Lisbon in Portugal still holds out against the fast food invaders. And life is not easy for the 
Oh, come on. Yes, McDonald's only opened a store in Lisbon at about the same time it, it had reached Moscow. And sure, there is a pattern in all that. But let's focus on, you know, the Lusitanians. The year is 500 BC. Western Europe is entirely occupied by the Celts. Well, not entirely. One small village of indomitable Lusitanians still holds out against the invaders. And life is strange for the Celtic invaders. Finally, sorry for all this AI confusion. But not to lose everything, I hope you got the general idea. That is, Lusitania is like an island. Both in the sense that whatever is happening elsewhere will get late here, but also that once that not so new thing arrives, the older occupants have nowhere else to go. They can't be further displaced and are forced to cohabitate, mix and adapt. As did the Neanderthal with the Cro-Magnon, likewise did the Lusitanians with the Celts. So this Lusitanian being Celts or pre-Indo-European, it's complicated. Let's just say they made a superposition. They are neither and the two at the same time. The original Iberians from the peninsula are not Indo-European. Remembering that the Indo-European or Aryan are a group of peoples, including the Celts, that reached Europe from the steppes, created basically all the languages we talk today, and replaced the old Europeans, such as the Nuragi in Sardinia, the Picts in Scotland, the Pelasgian in Greece, and sure, the Iberians in Iberia. So, during that time, the Celts were pushing west around the 10th to the 5th century BC, the Iberians kept on living their lives with their crazy languages like the Basque and weird dry stone constructions. But eventually, the Celts did arrive into the peninsula and accommodations had to be made. We don't know how this Celt-Iberic clash went. All we know is that by the time the Romans arrived, over 300 years later, most of the peninsula had been converted into Celtic, except for the Basques, that to this day don't mix with anybody else, and the Lusitanians, that, as always, had somehow created a mix that's unique, an Aryan-speaking old European builder. Let's make some simplifications of this topic of the oldest constructions in Europe to make it digestible. Whilst the Aryans were raiders coming from the steppes and could not build anything beyond a mud hut, the Neolithic inhabitants of Europe were prolific builders. Everywhere, and also in Portugal, we can find dolmens. Engines. Tumulus. And even Tolos. Then, as the Bronze Age progressed, we see dry stone or polygonal masonry. But on the outside of the continent, near the sea, in Italy, Greece, the Talayot of Menorca or the Nuragi in Sardinia. Following that comes the collapse of the Bronze Age, with the Celts rolling over France and England, inaugurating some dark ages of stone construction, with all those Cyclopean skills apparently lost, except in Lusitania. Here's my theory. The year is 300 BC. 
Western Europe is entirely swept by Aryans, Indo-Europeans, brutes that cannot build with dry stone. Well, not entirely. One small castro of indomitable Lusitanians still resists and is building polygonal walls. This goes against the academic gospel, but I cannot find a better explanation for the coincidence of the Aryans arriving into Europe and the megalithic or dry stone buildings retreating into the islands or to Lusitania. For sure there was a culture clash between the Indo-European standards and the more sophisticated old Europeans in the West. That, I think, ultimately ended with polygonal masonry having its last stand in Lusitania. And, to put this theory to the test, on the next video we'll take on to the sea, to investigate the sea peoples of the Bronze Age. Until then, see you around!